There you go. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, OPHS president for the past, co-president for the past four years, and uh, I've never done this before. Uh, you've always had a beautiful face doing this before <laughs> and more articulate than I am. But uh, anyway, here goes. Uh, we have schedules for upcoming programs in the back with the latest uh, newsletter. You probably see these around town. I'll put it up here. Um, and uh, I should point out also, because I have the prerogative to do so, uh, there's a great lecture in August, uh, something about after Dunbar. Uh, you should really check that out. Um, but uh, OVHS is involved in lots of exciting things uh, currently. We're working with Coastal Rivers, and uh, we've uh, saved the Pemquid Falls Mill. Uh, they purchased, Coastal Rivers purchased that, and uh, with the help of so many people. And uh, so plans are working on the conservation and access to the river, as well as uh, advancing plans for the, uh, what we call a Bristol History Center. Um, we hope it's all going to be there. It will be all there. Um, uh, we had a yard sale last month and we made enough money to uh, put our digital image archive online. Uh, right now we have almost 1,400 uh, catalog records on there. There's also a lot of genealogical stuff there that people will find interesting as well. Uh, and that's coming pretty soon. Uh, we also received a Maine Communities Grant, uh, which uh, allowed us to buy some equipment, which Russ is actually using some of it now, uh, to record oral histories. We're going to really go forward with an oral history project, mainly focused on fishing and tourist, tourism, but there's obviously things that affect other things. So we're going to be doing that, and we're working on a list of uh, priority lists for people would, that we'd like to interview, uh, for the uh, that would you know by the end of this year to get get a good start on it. Um, so, uh, if you want to become a member, there's forms in the newsletter. The newsletter is really well wit written. Uh, Belinda did most of it, except we have a, a good we have a good thing uh, a good article by um, Jones. Who is Larry it? Jones. Larry Jones. Yeah, Larry Jones in there. It's very good. Nice little map in there showed what things were like when he was uh, working there. Um, uh, we also have a donation box, which I don't hear any change there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think that's about it. So uh, I've had my five minutes of fame now. And, uh, so without further amiss uh, ado, uh, uh, program director uh, Bobby Eyes will introduce our tonight's speaker. Thank you. Uh, so I too would like to welcome you all. Thank you very, very much for coming and for coming to the first of our series of seven different talks on behalf of the Old Bristol Historical Society about the town of Bristol and Bristol's history. So we feel very honored and privileged to have with us a native son in the form of Chad Hanna. The Hanna family, of course, goes back seven generations to the 1830s out on Franklin Island Light. Captain Thomas Hanna and Mary had eight sons who eventually moved into New Harbor, and hence uh, Chad is uh, the fifth generation. In any event, Chad tonight will be speaking, of course, about his father as well as his uncle about World War II. But Chad, of course, is also a distinguished individual in our midst. Chad was uh, born and raised here, went to Bristol School, Lincoln Academy, Southern Maine Community College, where he majored in electrical engineering. And then he became an electrical engineer at Bath Iron Works for 19 years. Then on to Round Pond Harbor, where he became a lobster fisherman for 11 years. Then on the master's machine shop for nine years, and currently, Chad is the captain or one of the captains of the Hardy boat, the ferry boat out to Menhigan Heights. So Chad, of course, again, is no stranger. He's the head of our town. So if you don't know Chad, you don't know the town of Bristol. Chad has been the first selectman 
for 18 years of our time. So it's a great privilege to have him here. Chad, thank you so much for sharing about your day. Oh, I'm gonna... Thank you for that uh, introduction, Bob. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into this. I don't have a script. I'm not good at scripts, so this is going to be off the top of my head as I go. Uh, I do have a slideshow that uh, to go with this. I'm, you know, I have some information on the slides, but again, I'm going to try to do this just as kind of a stream of conscious thing. And uh, oops, I've got some feedback going. Dave's going to adjust the sound here so we don't hurt anybody's ears. So again, this is the story of uh, my Uncle Carol and my father George. And uh, I called it a two brothers in a big war, uh, crossing paths and shared history. Uh, they both had very different careers. My uncle was a, ended up as a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army in the 36th Infantry Division. My father was a, a coxswain one in the U.S. Navy. Uh, served in the European theater as well as the Pacific theater and, and uh, one of the things that's very interesting they did cross paths and that was kind of where I came up with the crossing paths and the shared history. They did cross paths briefly during the war and participated in a, a, one of the large, larger events in the European theater um, at that time. So I'll have Dave pop up to the next. So Carol Melvin Hanna uh, Commission, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1941. My father uh, went to boot camp at the Naval Training Center in Newport, Rhode Island in September of 43. So that was, uh, and again, one of the things I wanted to mention that as I've been doing these talks over time for family and you know, other things, uh, I always find that I can, I learn more every time I do it. And also I find that it's like, I want more time to be able to talk about what I need to talk about. So this is going to be, I'll, I'll say it's going to be an abbreviated history of, of what they did during the war. So I won't, I won't be able to go into a ton of detail, but you'll get a good idea. And, and I wanted to focus on when they, when they met and the little story that goes around that. So Just you, next, yep. Yeah. All right. So Uncle Carroll was, he served stateside for, for a number of years. He was in the 1st Infantry Division for a while, which played a big role actually at Normandy, but he wasn't there. He got transferred to the 26th, ended up in the 36th Division, which was a, started out as a Texas, um, basically Army National Guard unit, but they served, they ended up as a full-blown division during World War II, fought through Africa, Sicily, Europe. Um, and uh, Uncle Carroll's fighting career actually started when he was under enemy fire for the first time was September of 1943 in the beaches at, in Salerno, Italy. And uh, the, if you know anything about the history of World War II, the Germans fought fiercely. They had set up defensive lines the whole length of Italy and it was just terrible fighting through the whole of Italy. And it was the first time that that U.S. troops had landed and fought in, essentially, in, in the continent of Europe during the war. Next. And again, this map isn't a great map. It's just, uh, it shows, this shows the beaches of Salerno here where all the divisions went in. These, these dotted lines are all the defensive lines that the Germans had previously set up when they knew that, that we were coming. And, uh, and again, this is going to, it's going to have to be brief, but they landed, fought, you know, fiercely the whole way. Um, some of the famous battles you may have heard or read about, San Pietro, Caserta, uh, Rapido River was one of the hard moments for the 36th Division. You may have heard of uh, Monte Cassino, the famous abbey on top of the mountain. It, uh, it ended up, uh, we sent in 225 uh, bombers and uh, bombed it into oblivion, a, a famous historical site. There was a lot of bad uh, bad feelings about that, uh, you know, instilled to this day, but uh, it didn't drive the Germans out, so they had to f fight them out the hard way. Um, so after Monte Cassino, the 36th Division, and again, this is from September to mid-February, they were under al almost continuous enemy fire during that time period. They finally got relief in mid-February after Monte Cassino. By that point in 1944, mid-February, they lost half their combat strength. 
Um, so if you go to the next slide. And after being relieved at Monte Casino, um, they were allowed a period of rest. And then they took part in the, uh, the May, what was called the May Offensive. And uh, they landed in Anzio. Now Anzio, had, there had been a, a major landing at Anzio in January of 44, and the U.S. Army was stalled there. They had been stalled there for months. The Germans had, had them pinned down, and they never could get off the beach there. So after the 36th Division rested, they were... Uh, they landed in the 36th Division, amazingly broke the, kind of was one of the divisions that broke the dam and, and started moving inland. And by, the end, by June 5th, uh, Rome had fallen. And in, uh, in basically that, you know, there was fighting after Rome, but that was a major, a major um, event there, the fall of Rome on June 5th. I put a note there just, just to, to tie things together. The next day, my father was at the invasion of Normandy. So. I, I've tried to, I'll try to pull those coincidental, you know, things where they both were at the time. So next, I'm going to jump over now because uh, what happens after the fall of Rome in, in that time period is is where our story comes together. But again, my father was he he enlisted at the Customs House in in West Cassidy. He always talked about how how he thought that was a pretty neat deal. Like say he was at the U.S. Naval Training Center in Newport, Rhode Island, for basic training in all of his. Uh, they did all the training there, not just basic, but uh, an interesting story when he was there. Um, he ended up with appendicitis when he was at gunnery school. <laughs> and he uh, was in the hospital for 28 days. He wasn't allowed out of bed for two weeks. Um, so one of the interesting stories that happened, uh, he, was, he would, was ended up in a different group in, to finish his training, but uh, he missed out narrowly because of that, being assigned to the USS Franklin, which was an Essex-class uh, carrier that uh, in, uh, I think it was in March of 1945, was, was severely attacked by kamikazes and lost 800 crew members. So it, you see sometimes uh, this narrow, how narrowly you can miss a, something that might have totally changed, certainly my family's history. Again, he completed his training in 1943, went to Lido Beach, Long Island, to the receiving station, and that's where he was assigned to the ship USS Akinar. It was an AKA-53. There's a ship model here. You, uh, ho hopefully you can get a look at it. I, I built it for my father for Christmas one year before he passed away. But uh, it's one of the mass-built ships during World War II. It was, a very, it was a very sophisticated ship. It wasn't like a Liberty ship. It wasn't a thrown together ship. It was a very sophisticated cargo ship. There were hundreds of them made in different variations. So again, uh, if you go to the next slide, that's uh, just before you do, that's a picture on my father's ship of his division at the time. Uh, that's him kneeling down on the, he's kind of the, the second from the right, kneeling down. And that's his best friend, Jim Lydon from Alston, Mass. So if you know any Lydons from Alston, Mass, Send them my way. I'd love to speak to them. But so next slide, please. All right. So the Akinara, he was a what was called a plank owner. He was on the commissioning crew of the Akinara, January 31st, 1944, down at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They went on some shakedown cruises. It went down to Norfolk, Virginia, got fitted out, headed to England on March of 1944, March 20th. Um, all during that time, from March until uh, till. Uh, Late May, they, they did preparations for the invasion of Normandy. Uh, my father's ship was a communication ship for the Normandy invasion, and he also had the staff of the, uh, the First Army. Uh, Brigadier General Courtney Hodges was the commanding general. And, and that plays a little role in his, you know, in his story at Normandy. So if you go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, and by the way, uh, Uncle Carroll was you know, at the May Offensive in, in Italy at this time, fighting his way to Rome. So. All right, and uh, again, this is, uh, I'm going to jump right to D-Day. Like I say, there was a lot of preparation, a lot of things happened in England during the way, but he was at Omaha Beach. Now, that was the most, you know, fierce fighting at, at Normandy. Um, again, he was, uh, the Rome had fallen the day before, so Uncle Carroll had a little bit of a, a break in the action at that point. Uh, the crew of the Akinar was fortunate on D-Day. Again, as I mentioned, they were a communication ship. 
and they had staff, primarily staff people on board. They did have some equipment, but primarily staff people. So, and the staff people ended up not going ashore until June 11th. They did make some supply runs in, you know, a couple of days after the beachhead was secured. So, again, for the crew of the Akinau, that was a fortunate circumstance. They didn't have to go on the first, second, or third wave on the first day. Uh, you know, it, again, it would have been a different story. And, uh, of course, on, at Omaha Beach, there were estimates of as high as 5,000 people killed that day on Omaha Beach. It ranges anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000, but a lot, of, a lot of people gave their lives that day. And uh, my father told the story, you know, after he'd gone on the beach, seeing all, you know, they had, had by then were taking care of the dead bodies, but, and he was looking for his brother that day. And, but, uh, and he, he didn't know till later that Carol wasn't there, but uh, he was concerned that he might be there, and he did look for him at, you know. So next slide, please. All right. After the uh, initial invasion, the, the Akinar made uh, multiple supply runs back and forth to England. And, uh, and uh, interesting, on their last trip back to England, uh, my father always told this story. He was at the helm of the Akinar at that, that particular day. That was his duty. And uh, as they were exiting the Normandy Beach area, headed back to England, there were three merchant ships coming their way. And, under the rules at the time, the merchant ships were supposed to give way to any naval vessel, but they chose not to, so my father's captain said, okay, we'll give way. As they turned away from those ships, they ran into a minefield and they watched all three merchant ships sink within, within two minutes. So again, it's, uh, it just amazed me these stories they told of all these narrow, narrow you know, things that could have just changed so differently. So, and then, uh, by July 5th, they sailed for Iran, Algeria, and unloaded cargo, and sailed to, to Naples, Italy, and that's where they arrived there on July 17th, in 1944. So, uh, next slide, please. Which one was your father? My father? George. No. Huh? <laughs> Which one's my father right there? Yeah. Yeah. All right, next slide. So. Now this is where their, their paths cross, and, and this is, this is kind of, it's very interesting. So between July 18th and August 15th, that was the date of the Southern France invasion, both my father and Carol were in Naples, Italy, preparing for the invasion. Uh, and uh, again, they were both destined to, to participate in the invasion. It was called Operation Dragoon. You don't hear a lot about the invasion of Southern France. It was not as fiercely opposed, although the fighting afterwards was just as severe. But uh, so shortly after the 18th, uh, my Uncle Carol actually made the contact with my father. He came aboard my father's ship. I have a letter that he, taught, he, he wrote. He, I actually have the letter. He, he had written it to his mother and father telling about meeting my father there. They talked, got to meet for about an hour and a half and intended to get together again. And uh, along the way, what happened was uh, my uncle Carol got in. He they, he said it was influenza in his letter. He was very sick and in the hospital. He was still working in the hospital. Uh, one of the, his responsibilities at that time, he was uh, responsible for what they called the loadout of his ship. He was assigned. My father always talked about him being on the Florence Nightingale, which was a. It was a. Used to be a commercial cargo ship, and it was converted for war use. But it was AP seventy. That's a picture of the Florence Nightingale, all loaded out. You can see it's got the landing craft on the deck just like my father's ship did but his job at that time was to to load out to load out the ship he decided where everything went what they needed it was a very responsible job at the time and uh, but anyways they saw each other that day he was busy intended to get back together so if you want to go to the next slide i might have jumped into the next slide already but <laughs> a little bit there we go so yeah yeah now, uh, you see the draw, I'm going to put a plug in for my oldest son, Chad, he, he's an artist that, uh, he drew that picture for me for, for a Father's Day card, um, and this, and I'll tell you the story about it, but anyways, uh, anyway, I told you, Uncle Carol ended up in the hospital with influenza, couldn't meet my father again, so he sent his Jeep driver, his staff sergeant over, and my father always knew his name right to the day he died, Frankie Slater from Texas, he always yeah. talked about Frankie Slater from Texas, so, they went on a joyride around Naples, and uh, he always talked about uh, 
they got a big jug of Chianti wine and, and a basket of, <laughs> basket of apricots, and they drove around, and I think they probably tore up the countryside pretty good, and my guess would be. Uh, so, so that was my uncle's gift to him. So, yeah, and uh, so again, that's the origin of the picture. My son drew, drew it for me one day. That, that's uh, my fa supposed to be, you know, my father and Frankie Slater, the, you know, the sergeant from Texas. So, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, all right, so, and again, their shared history really continues until the day of the invasion. They were both at, they were both at the invasion. My father's ship had soldiers from the 36th Division as well, but just not my, my uncle's uh, regiment. It was a different uh, regiment, of, probably just a battalion, if that. But um, the invasion of southern France, it, it's a beautiful place, the French Riviera. So, and again, this, this map's not the greatest map, but... Uh, the beach that they landed on is near, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's near Marseille. It's up around the corner from Marseille. Saint Raphael is, is the is the the actual city nearest, and, and they were they were the far, almost the far right flank. The 36th Division landed right here, and uh, and the, it began at 7:30 in the morning on on August 15th. You know, we just had the 70, you know. 75th anniversary of Normandy, or the 70th, or I can't remember now, but uh, in uh, the same, you know, it was the same year, just a few months later, and uh, I'll include a general's name. There was a general on board my father's ship, and his name was General Robert Stack, and uh, he was the commanding general. They landed, the beach they landed on was called the Camel Assault Area. Uncle Carroll landed on one end of the beach, my father ended on the other. And uh, Uncle Carroll came up the beach. He didn't meet my father. He tried, but he found sailors from my father's ship on the beach and left a message, said, I made it ashore safely. And that was their last contact for a while. So, but uh, I'll go to the next slide. All right, so. And uh, actually, I'm going to tell a little story here that doesn't relate to this slide, but. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of, these are copies. Uh, my cousin Marshall has the original. These are actual, there's actual copies of the invasion map for the invasion of southern France. So these are all, all uh, scanned copies of them. Marshall has the original, but I want to tell the story because General Stack was related to that. Uh, but uh, my father at the time of the invasion was captain's orderly. Um, and one of his jobs out right after the invasion was he was sent to General Stack's room to clean it up. And on General Stack's desk was a nice stack of Southern France invasion maps. So my father thought that they would make a good souvenir. <laughs> if you look at the maps closely, you say it says Mark taught secret <laughs> until the day of the invasion. But it, uh, you know that was my father. He didn't think it was you know it didn't think it was too big a risk to take. <laughs> but he that they made it all the way home with him from the war, and later on you know he he gave them to my my uncle Carol as a gift and and uh, so because uh, my uncle Carol was very involved with the 36th Division after the war. So that's a little side story that I wanted to throw in there just and uh, and by the way, General Stack's brother was married to my grandmother Crocker's sister. <laughs> <laughs> Figure that one out. So, all right, this, and again, now, now we're going to see that paths diverge, and, and what I'll do is I'll try to run through this brief, difficult ending of the war for my Uncle Carol, you know, the, what he went through. And uh, so, again, on the 15th, they landed. My father's ship started doing supply runs back and forth between Naples and southern France. They went to Oran. Most of the supplies came through Oran, Algeria. And his ship made its final trip to southern France on October 4th. And you think by October 4th, from August 15th to October 4th, it's 51 days. The 36th Division was under continuous enemy fire for 51 days at that point already. Just, just a perspective there. So anyways, my father um, headed back to the States and destined for the Pacific Theater. So next slide, please. 
All right, I, <laughs> some of my maps are kind of funny. This is kind of a souvenir 36 division map that shows kind of generally where they went after the invasion. But uh, they landed near St. Raphael. He, I put, I hit, that should be 142nd Regiment, not Battalion. That was, uh, that was one that I tried to find it and I, I knew I put it in there. But again, they went through all these towns, and I, I can't begin to pronounce them because I don't speak French at all. Cisteron is a fam famous town, but uh, they were in uh, basically near Lyon, in, uh, or Montelamar, I'm sorry, uh, by August 23rd. And that was really the first major battle that they had, and it took them about a week, and they, they ended up securing that city, continued on fighting. So if you want to go to the next slide, <laughs> yeah, all right. So they, they kept on moving through France, kind of, it, they were in southern France, and they were kind of working, I'll say, to, to north, northeastern France, probably, is really a north, you know, but, or, or eastern France. But uh, again, I listed all the towns. I, I, it's amazing. They just, they, it was, this was just a rapid fire, nonstop, all the way. Uh, all the way in Lyons, uh, my cousin Marshall just came from Lyons, uh, France. He, he and his wife went on a trip and uh, had a wonderful time there. And, and that was one of the cities that they liberated you know, fairly early after the invasion. And they ended up in a, a city called Ramiremont. This map, again, it's, it's a, I'm not, a, like I say, I need to study the geography of France a little better to understand. but. You can see, I mean, they're not, we're well beyond, you know, southern France is down here and they're already up approaching, you know, not too far from the, from the German border at this point and uh, in a town called Ramiremont. And uh, again, they, they had been in continuous fighting up to that point, but the, they, they fought, they were fighting in that area, that Ramiremont area until October 23rd. So next slide. And, uh, they did get a little bit of a break at that point, and then they started started fighting what was the Vosges Mountains in in France as a famous battleground for Europe. Um, and at the time, no army in Europe had ever fought successfully from west to east in the Vosges Mountains, and that's where the 36th Division headed. And uh, so, at October October 25th, they were. They were in this area. You can see the 142nd mark there. They were, they were, they were in kind of a holding line there, and then the other di divisions were, or regiments were, were on the move. The 143rd. If you're not familiar, uh, the 442nd is, isn't part of the, the 36th division, but they were fighting with them. That was the Japanese American, the famous Japanese American uh, regiment during World War II fought alongside them and had a shared history there. So again, uh, as I said, no army had successfully fought in that direction in Europe through the Vosges Mountains. Very difficult terrain, uh, very perfect for defensive battle. So next slide, please. So things changed on November 7th, 1944 in that region of the Vosges Mountains. On a, I understand it was on a night patrol Uncle Carroll, or somebody near him, tripped what was called a bouncing Betty mine, uh, the, the, the German S mine. And that's an actual picture of one from a museum. That little diagram shows you the theory behind the bouncing Betty. It pops up waist high, has ball bearings in it. It's designed to maim, not kill. And uh, of course, Uncle Carroll was, in some respects, was fortunate. Uh, he, he had his left hand was severely damaged by the mine, uh, and at at that point, he, because it was all, most of the bones were broken in his hand, I think you know whatever other shrapnel wounds he might have had, sent to a field hospital, and then eventually went to a field uh, hospital in in England. Uh, this is one piece of the history that I don't have a solid handle on yet. I'm trying to figure out exactly when he got out of the hospital when he got back to the 36th Division. I have, I have a rough estimate, but at that point, um, in the field hospital, the bones in his hand had healed where they were when he went to England. They had to break the bones in his hand to reset them. So, I, like I say, I have to talk about this stuff because it's an important part. This isn't, this isn't um, 
light reading, I guess you'd say, at this point in time. So any, anyways, uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, again, he su suffered severe damage to his left hand, was in the hospital in England for a long time. Uh, he did eventually return to the 36th Division before the end of the war. As I said, the timing's not, I don't know exactly, but I think it was in, you know, February or March of 1945 that he returned. It could have been as early as January, but I, I, I'm pretty safe to, us, to say that it, it happened sometime in February or March. And one of the uh, parts of uh, 36th Division history, if you've ever heard of it, it's called the Lost Battalion. But uh, a, a part of the 36th Division, it was, the, it was actually the 141st Regiment was advancing in the Vosges Mountains. The Germans counterattacked counter and trapped them, and uh, the 442nd Japanese American Division helped fight to save them. And uh, eventually, the rest of the 36th Division, the engineers built roads in and they got in, and then the 142nd Regiment, which Uncle Carroll was part of, came in and relieved the, that lost battalion after, after they had driven the, the Germans out. But it's a famous part of the 36th Division history. So next slide. All right, so we're advancing you know, further in, you know, here it is in the middle of the winter and they're, they're advancing to the Motor River all the way up through to Wiesenberg is just, just outside of the, you know, ac across the German border. And that's, uh, that's where they were in the middle of March of 1945. So again, fight, 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 fight all the way. It's, it's just a, an amazing story. So next slide, please. Again, I apologize for having to rush through this because I, I, I probably have blown my time limit already. But <laughs> so here's another another piece of uh, of uh, they, they finally I think they entered Germany. Yeah, they entered Germany. It's March 20th. They start fighting through in these various towns: uh, Schweigen, Grasberg, Dornbach. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is I'm I'm going to slide through this quick. Just uh, and this is kind of uh, this is how the war ended for. For the most part, for Uncle Carroll, I mean, this this goes takes us to the German surrender. They fought down through. They had gotten a brief break um, there in March and April, but on April 29th, uh, they relieved the 63rd Division in Landsberg, Austria, which was the the site of an extermination camp. And uh, it was probably one of the things that, you know, based on talking with my father, that had some of the deepest impact on my uncle, so. And uh, at, by, the, by the time the Germans had surrendered, or, or near that time, the 142nd was down near, uh, almost you know, into Kitzbühel, and Kufstein is the city, and they liberated a whole bunch of the French, pre-war French political leaders that had been in prison there, Edward Delardier, Paul Renault, Maurice Gamelin, General Wygand and his wife, uh, the sister of Charles de Gaulle, and they also captured Hermann Goering. Um, and uh, Carol, Uncle Carroll always told the story. He, he believed firmly in his heart that they captured Ava Braun, and she was spirited away from them without, and told not to talk about it. There was some, some later history, some, a few newspaper articles talking about speculating that it might have happened. But he always believed that, that when at that time that they captured Hermann Goering, they also captured Eva Braun. But that's a mystery that probably we'll never know. So, anyways, that brings brings us to the end of the war. I, th you know, again, I don't have a lot of history about what happened after the German surrender. I, I believe that uh, he was there for a while, you know, doing occupation duty. Um, but that's something that I need to do some more research on for another time. So, next slide, please. So I think, there we go, we're jumping back to the USS Achenar. Um, so my father went back to the States, they went to Norfolk, did a little overhaul there. Uh, just before Christmas in uh, 44, they headed for the Panama Canal and they passed the, through the Panama Canal on Christmas Eve. And this was Christmas dinner in 1944 on the USS Achenar. He brought a picture home of it, Some, you know, it's one of, part of his collection. Uh, they passed through the Panama Canal, headed for Pearl Harbor. So next slide, please. All right, so you've seen this picture before. I think Russ, I, uh, I gave it to Russ to use for, a, for another, for the, 
the Veterans Memorial thing, but uh, again, that's, I, I put the names on it this time. That's my father on the left, Paul Hanner, and is my father's friend, Jim Lydon from Alston, Mass. But uh, from January to March of 45, they were, he, they were spent most of their time at Pearl Harbor. They did some training. They, they uh, transported some, did some transport trips. They were at Annie Weetalk Island, which was one of the islands that ended up as a nuclear test site. Ulithi, Castle Roads, and the Palo Islands. Uh, you got to see Paul a bunch of times in Hawaii. They had a grand time in, in Honolulu. Uh, some of the stories, <laughs> he tells a story about go, they go, took horses out for a ride and he said they didn't think the horse was in very good shape after they were done in the day. They rode the horse pretty hard. But uh, in one of the things I laughed about, this is a side story, not on the slide, but uh, my father wrote a little one-page letter to my mother. And now, so you, you can picture, if you knew my grandmother, She's very quiet and, and humble person, but uh, he wrote a nice little letter to her from Hawaii. From and uh, the stationery is nice, it's this nice thin paper, and it has a beautiful Hawaiian girl in a very short grass skirt in a in a lay. That uh, <laughs> he sent that to his mother for a letter. I, I, if I know my father, it might have been on purpose, but he, he, might, he, he might have been oblivious to it too, but I, I got a kick out. When I opened up that letter, I, it, I, I couldn't help but laugh to, to see it. But uh, again, they met several times. Paul was a radio, radio man on the USS New York, which was actually a World War I era battleship. Uh, and uh, they were both at Okinawa together uh, at the time. But, so March 7th, the Akinara leaves for the Leyte Gulf, San Pedro Bay, and the Philippines, and they began preparations for the invasion of Okinawa. Uh, at this time, uh, Uncle Carroll was almost to the, to the German border in, in France, so at a city called Oberhofen. So next slide, please. All right, so a big part of my father's story was Okinawa. Uh, uh, so they arrived in, in Okinawa on April 1st. The following day, just barely the following day, at uh, 12.45 a.m., the Okinawa was struck by a, a single engine. Uh, it was called, they called it a Sonya. It was a Mitsubishi bomber with a single 500-pound bomb, bomb attached. This photo is from my father's ship. Uh, they had large deck cranes, and the, the plane flew through the rigging, kind of broke up a little bit, but the 500-pound bomb in parts of the plane penetrated through the superstructure and as near as they can tell, the bomb penetrated the hull and blew up outside of the hull, actually, but below the waterline. Uh, had severe damage. Uh, the damage control party was right in the vicinity of the bomb blast, so their primary damage control people were, uh, were severely injured. But uh, they had fires. They, put the, they got the fires out. They stopped the damage to the hull, got, got the ship pumped out and functional. Uh, at the time of the... the Kamikaze impact, and if you if you like later, I can point out to you. But he was on a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun up above the pilot house on the ship, and the the Kamikaze hit on the mirror opposite side of the ship from him. And uh, again, this shows the crane damage. You can see these are landing craft here; those got damaged when the crane booms fell. But uh, and again, so the next slide, please. And. Uh, Forty sailors were wounded and seven killed during the kamikaze attack. Uh, the the Akinar ended up at Okinawa for 19 days, even though they had severe battle damage. Uh, during that 19 days, there were 250 air raids. And they had to man the anti-aircraft guns every night, all night long. Um, again, uh, they were there for 19 days. Uh, one of the interesting stories about the Akinar, probably why they had to stay there so long, there was a lit major logistics error. All the medical supplies for the combat medics were on the Akinar. And they had to be, that was the only ship that had them. It was a major mistake, but uh, the deck division that was responsible for the cranes got a presidential unit citation. They got the cranes re-rigged and operating within a few days, and they were able to successfully unload all of their cargo. And uh, so, uh, next slide, yeah. That, and again, uh, oh, could you go back to that? I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, just so you see, that's the stern of, a, of an LCM. That's a 60-foot long plus landing craft. And that's the landing gear of the, of the Kamikaze airplane embedded in the stern of that. And that's another one of the pictures that my father was able to bring back with him. So thank you, Dave. Next slide. 
All right. Um, the Akinaw went back, they went back via Hawaii, back to San Francisco. Did, they repaired all the battle damage, went to, Oak, uh, went to Oakland and San Diego, picked up stores and supplies, and headed back to Hawaii, got back on August 10th of 1945. And uh, this picture is from the USS Akinaw when the surrender of the Japanese was announced. And uh, this anti-aircraft fire, <laughs> so um, a major call went out immediately. Said you got to stop firing because the anti-aircraft rounds were falling all over Pearl Harbor and people were getting hurt. So, but everybody was so excited they thought, well, this would be a good way to have a fireworks show. Those are the tracer rounds. But that's Pearl Harbor on the night of the when when they were when they found out about the Japanese surrender. So there were some happy folks there, but a little carried away. But a fun story nonetheless. So next slide, please. All right. I'm going to abbreviate this tail end of the war. It's a, it's an interesting story, but again, I, I want to hold you know somewhat within my time constraints, and and I can answer questions or whatever afterwards. But he served aboard the Akinar when it was commissioned in 1944, and he was mustered out of the Navy in March of 1946. Um, after the formal surrender, he brought troops home from the Pacific. You know told about, you know, they went to islands and brought units off, and he had a, he had a great story. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a CB unit was stuck on this island. I think it was called Espiritu Santo. And anyways, the CB unit had been there a while, but they hauled all the equipment off, and one night my father was tending, he, they were loading the equipment in the hull of the ship, and I always wondered where he came up with his fear of spiders, but... Uh, they were loading a piece of equipment down in the hull and he was guiding it down through the hatch cover and something came away in his hand and he he said he looked and he said it was a spider that filled his hand and that was the last thing he remembered he passed out cold <laughs> <laughs> had to be revived and and uh, so i grew up with my father having a terrible fear of spiders and whether that's the or, or the, or the origin of it i don't know but it's an interesting story uh, again, they made several trips to Japan, uh, you know, Nagoya, uh, Wakayama. Uh, they went back to Okinawa a few times, and they made several trips actually to, to mainland China, to Tsingtao, China. And he has some great stories there as well. But uh, I'm gonna, I'll skip by those tonight. This picture here on the left, that's that's at Okinawa. That was the area where, where they assembled the ships that had been damaged. They had a kind of a, re a resting area until the ships could be ready to, to go back to be repaired. And that's my father and his buddies in San Francisco. I think that's ginger ale they're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't, let's see, what do we got here? We got, I think we got the last slide, so yeah, again, I, I, like I say, I feel like I could go on for, for many more hours here, you know, and, and I wanted to abbreviate it to, to get it to, Close. But again, another picture of my father, great picture of Uncle Carroll. Um, I don't know for sure, I'm guessing that's his, his first lieutenant's bar on his hat, it's nice and shiny and bright. Um, and uh, you can see the foot locker inside the tent. And there it is right there. So, so uh, anyways, that, uh, that concludes my anything, the formal talk. And I'd, like I said, I'd be glad to answer questions or we can look at things. And, and I can explain some of the souvenirs. Right. Yeah. Did yeah. Carroll have permanent damage to his hand? Yeah, he, he did. If, if you ever saw Uncle Carroll driving, especially, I always noticed it when I was you know, riding with him and his, he had a kind of a tremor in his hand. You didn't notice it so much unless he was holding on to something. But uh, I never heard him complain about it just went on but uh, yeah and uh, Uncle Carol always told a funny story about uh, in Italy they were this was a, one of the brief periods in Italy where they were able to get some rest it was probably after the fall of Rome because it was warm weather they were somewhere in Italy there's a nice big pond there and 300 guys in taking baths swimming and Uncle Carol and one of his buddies decided they would go fishing well they they found an old skiff, and they rowed out into the pond, and they dropped a shape charge into the pond. <laughs> and uh, 
it blew the, blew the caulking out of the skiff, so they had to swim ashore, but the worst thing was there were 300 guys running and screaming out of the water from the concussion from the charge, so I won't go into it in any more depth than that, but he always, he, he couldn't, he loved telling that story because it was one of those few, you know, one of those rare moments where you really, you know, you get a laugh and all this terrible things going on, but uh, yeah, so, oh goodness, yeah. I can tell, you know, I'd always, I'll tell the ch story about one of the stories my father told in China. They were in Tsingtao. They came up to these big stone piers and, and by then, of course, it was well after the surrender and, and the Japanese surrender and they would come, uh, arrive at the dock, the sun would come up in the morning and there would be thousands of Chinese men on the dock, all huddled up just in shorts, no, clo no clothing, barefoot. and. Uh, what they did then was they hired the, the Chinese to unload all the ships, so the sailors loved it. They didn't have to do anything. They, so they, they would unload and the Chinese would, laborers would do all the work. It was something, I guess, to help put a little bit of money into the economy, but uh, he got liberty one time in Sing Tao, and, and when the, the Chinese knew that it was liberty time and the rickshaw drivers would show up at, by the hundreds, and, uh, my father was on the dock looking for a rickshaw driver and there's all these young Chinese guys and he's kind of looking around and there's this old Chinese guy. He's, my father said he was all bent over and he looked like he was a hundred years old and he waved him over. And that rickshaw driver treated him like gold. He told, he told him all the places not to go, uh, made sure he didn't get ripped off buying things, but that guy hauled him all over. Sing Tao and treated him like a million bucks and my father thought he was going to kill the poor guy. but. Yeah, it was a very interesting story, but he, he was always amazed by, you know, all these poor Chinese, you know, so poor and so destitute at that point after the Japanese occupation. And, and they laid, at, laid on the dock overnight in the hopes of getting a job to unload the ships in the morning, so. Anybody have any other questions? Sure. Yeah? Uh, not to take any thunder away from what your uncle and father <coughs> produced, I'd like to point out that in Monte Casino, under General Zbadiswaf Anders, the Polish army was assigned Monte Casino. They took the greatest amount of cash. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's it's amazing. You know, you know, and, and one of the interesting things about the invasion of southern France, the the army that fought there, that it landed there, was French troops. Like say, Polish troops were in Italy, um, the Japanese Americans troops. It was a uh, it was a very blended group at the time, and, and certainly all, all the you know, different countries that were occupied by the Germans participated all through, the, through Europe, especially. So. But the, just to mention one more thing. Yeah? I was a boy at five, six years old in Poland under the Germans while your uncle was <laughs> traveling up there, so yeah. I kind of feel what yeah. is happening. Yeah, I'm sure you do. That's, uh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, I appreciate that because it's, it's always good to hear people who experienced it firsthand. Yes? In the 50s when we were kids, your Uncle Carroll never talked about the war at all. I vaguely remember something about a concentration camp, but he saw too much of all that uh, days of yeah. battle in the concentration camp. Yeah, he, I, I remember, you know, Growing up, and maybe it was in the confines of family, he talked about, he talk, spoke quite frequently about things that went on in the war, um, at least in, you know, the times that I remember. But yeah, La the Landsberg um, certainly um, had a terrible impact on him. You know, it, you know, it was the kind of the worst of humanity there, and a very helpless feeling because there was nothing you could really do for the people, you know, that were there. It was just. Uh, stand by and, and, and watch most of them die, and, and that was a very difficult thing. So, yeah. yeah. The other yeah. day, Daniel Henry was a uh, dedicated BIW. He was in the Japanese regiment. He lost his arm, I think, in Italy. Yeah. And he was carrying the Professional Medal of Honor. Yes. Yeah. That was well, the most decorated uh, unit in uh, the war. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it was. It, it, you're absolutely right. And, uh, Another interesting thing about the 36th Division uh, during the course of the fighting in Italy and sub, you know, in, in France, uh, 20, almost 28,000 casualties, um, almost uh, 
I think it was almost 5,000 killed, 4,000 missing, something like that. Um, I think there was, you know, sometime, somewhere around 19,000 wounded out of the casualties. But yeah, they, they, uh, they basically, a couple of times that they got to stop, it was because they were so depleted that, you know, there weren't enough people to function as a, as a military unit. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Uh, when, they, when, they, when the war started? Uh, when the war started, uh, my father enlisted at 18, and Uncle Carol, he, he was commissioned in 1941, so that would have made him what? He was born in 1918, right? <laughs> so, what's that make him? He'd, he'd, I think it was just after he graduated from uh, University of Connecticut, like 23, yeah, that sounds right. So. So, uh, like I say, my father was a, uh, got in the war as soon as they'd let him, and, and Uncle Carol was in, he was in, I, I, it was either ROTC or Army Reserve prior to the war, and then, then got a full commission at the very beginning of the war, so, yeah, yes. How did your grandparents survive having two sons in the war, what did they do? Um, Based on the letter, because I only got, I only have a one-sided view. I have, I have all the letters my father wrote to my grandmother. She kept them all, and my father ended up with them, and I, and I have them now. So I only have my father's side of it. In, in during the war, before the, you know, up until the final surrender, they weren't allowed to say much in their letters. Every, every envelope has a censor stamp on it. Some of the letters have stuff cut out of it, and. So they weren't allowed to say much. So it was kind of like, hey, um, I'm doing all right. How's Nancy doing? He wrote a, I have, uh, I shouldn't say, I should, should tell this story to my Aunt Nancy first, but uh, I got to tell it tonight. Just, he, my Aunt Nancy, I think, she's going to be 85 this year, so I can't do the math backwards right now. But she was a young girl during the war. And uh, my father wrote her a letter one time. He said, hi, Nancy, how you doing? Uh, he says, come to think of it, he says, you're so stupid, you're probably going to have to get Ma to read this letter for you. That's how he started out his letter. <laughs> and then he had a P.S. at the end and reminded her of the same thing. I'm sure that she was old enough to read, but, uh, you know, that's, that's my father, the joker ever. But, uh, so, yeah, yeah, and uh, so, yeah, we got questions back here, yes. Uh, this is a little bit more general, but I accidentally found out due to a family member of mine who died recently that the historical society in the town where he lived when he was went into the um, military they told they asked me if I had any letters that he had written to anybody because they said that historical societies were trying to get together and keep all the letters and that um, any people from the wars had written and I didn't know if people were involved in that and if other people do it because I actually, a bunch of my uncles ended up in the dumpster before I knew about oh, it, but that's, um, yeah, it's kind I, of as a, something that people might be, want to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, uh, it's worth, worth looking at them. I actually, I've had the letters for a few years and I, they wrapped up in an elastic and I really had never looked at them. And I decided in preparation for this, it's, it's like, I'm going to read these letters from all of them. And uh, it filled in a lot of holes, surprisingly, and verified a lot of his stories. Uh, uh, one of the great stories that he told about, um, this was after the formal surrender in September of 45. They went to Wake Island. The Japanese had, had taken Wake Island early in the war. And uh, they sent a small convoy there to, uh, to take, up, take the island back from the Japanese. And, uh, my father was assigned to what he called small boats, so he was driving one of these at Wake Island. The ships couldn't go inside the atoll. Wake Island's the three islands that make up an atoll, just narrow channels in between into the lagoon. Uh, he always told the story about going in 25 or 30 sailors and a couple of landing craft, and they, they spent the night on Wake Island. And across the, the ship channel, which wasn't very wide, was 2,500 Japanese that with all their arms stacked up in a big pile. And uh, one of the things they found, uh, they were going through the ship channel and they saw this big ball in the water. And they fished it out and it was a big ball of Japanese helmets. And my, my nephew Thomas has one of those helmets from Wake Island as part, part of the things my father brought back. But 
Um, he wrote a nice four-page letter to my grandmother from Wake Island, and he wrote it on Japanese stationery. It has Japanese printing on it, and, and he put a little map, and he said, this is where I slept, this is where the Japs slept. <laughs> you know? and it's, uh, so it's, it's been amazing, and, uh, and, and again, I know a lot more about my father's story. You know, it's kind of natural. I grew up with him and, and heard it right up until a few years ago, but it's amazing how many books I've been able to, to find that reference his book and confirm these stories that he was able to tell till the day he died and right, right to the letter and it's very interesting so somebody in the way in the back had a question yeah, just wondering about whether either of them your dad and your uncle were ever treated in the veterans administration system my father was late in life his late life care um, was prim primarily provided by the va was treated very well by the va uh, my uncle to the best of my knowledge, never went to a doctor after World War II. Never, never went to the doctor for anything. So, yeah, very, yeah, again, said, uh, more questions? Yes. That photograph of your dad, he could be a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 if you go back, I don't know if we can go back to, uh, he and his cousin Paul, you know, because very strong family resemblance, but yeah, they were, see if I can find it, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were pretty hot tickets there in those days, so. Yeah, I can, like say, I, I, he, he, he talked so much about, they, it was amazing to get to see Paul so much in Honolulu and stuff, but I'm sure it was all, all uh, raising the dickens, I'll say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I know PTSD comes a little bit later, but, you know, did you see or hear, did they talk about some of these things? My father, the only time I ever, you know, and it, it, it could be, I suppose, tied to his war experience, but nothing, that, the only time I ever knew my father to have PTSD was actually after he was, an oil, after he was in an oil tanker explosion in South Portland Harbor. We went to see the, uh, uh, what was it called? The, the famous movie where the, the ship goes upside down. I can't even remember the name of it. No, the Poseidon Adventure. Yep, I remember being in the movie theater with my father watching the Poseidon Adventure, and I've never seen him that way in my whole life. He had to leave the he had to leave the movie theater. But that that was not long after he was in this oil tanker explosion. Uh, as far as my uncle Carol, I don't I don't ever recall any time where he wasn't tough as nails, and I don't. Never saw him shrink from anything. <laughs> so, they, you know, they were very fortunate, and a lot of it, I think, was the they had the ability, at least in close friends, to be able to relate all these stories and, and talk them through. Yes. Ted, where was your mom during the war? Let's see. My my mother probably during the war. Her father was a an oil tanker captain, and uh, she was probably living in Portland. Well, either Portland or Boston at the time. I don't think they met till after the war. But uh, yeah, another interesting story, not related to, but interesting family history. My uncle Claude Crocker, um, he was a, he went he went to sea at 18, started shipping at 18 years old, ended up with an unlimited master's license, pilotage from Eastport, Maine to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, other than New York City. But uh, made, uh, it was, I'm trying to remember the number, it's either 26 or 36 crossings of the Atlantic in a freighter during World War II. And never was in a convoy, it was always one or two ships. But uh, yeah, and uh, so he, you know, was one of the rare merchant marines that, you know, never saw, a, like I say, like I say, I think it was 36 trips across the Atlantic. In a, in a small freighter. So, anyways, more questions? Have I run you run you out of steam? Yeah. <laughs> Chad, thank you. All right.